Hi, this is Sarah Burgess from 1080 and we are here for week 16 of our Career Insights session. So today we are focusing on portfolio careers and semi-retirement and I'm joined by two authors, which is excellent. So we've got David Meller, who's a specialist in semi-retirement and general business and startups, etc. Uh, and Trevor Meriden, who is a business and startup coach. Also, lots of other experience. So uh, we're just going to head straight on over into the first questions. But please do comment as we're going through, like, like and ask any questions as we go through so that, as always, we can make it as interactive as possible. So we're going to start with our first question, which is what is a portfolio career? And we're going to hand straight over to Trevor for this one. So over to you, Trevor. OK, thank, thanks, Sarah. Um, I mean, I suppose I could talk a little bit about the theory, if you like, about what is a portfolio career. I mean, there's a difference sometimes between the, the theory and the practice. I mean, essentially, it's when someone splits their time and skills between two or more flexible roles. For example, you could be running a small business alongside your employed role, or you could be working on several freelance roles at the, um, at the same time. And in my case, it means sort of splitting my time between my business. I run a content business, and the whole point of that is to give clients confidence in their content and mentoring um, business, you know, mentoring business startups uh, for, for 1080 to give them confidence to make good decisions. So, so there's a bit of, so, so that's, that's what it kind of is. Um, I suppose there are certain sort of rules that you should sort of think about in terms of having a clear vision of what you're trying to do in a portfolio career. For me, it's all about giving people confidence, as you probably realise. But there's other things about being prepared to put your head above the parapet in terms of marketing, not trying to take on the world, you know, with what you do in terms of, but, but to be fairly sort of focused on what you're what you're trying to do, even in a portfolio career, to show some sort of confidence in your own ability, you know, to be assertive, to say yes, but also on your on your terms. And then finally, to enjoy yourself. That's the that's really probably the most thing. It's you know, portfolio careers, I would say, are a fantastic way to follow your your passion. And and that's the theory. But I mean, I'm sure that David will have something to say about you know, sort of that, but also what it's what it's been like for him, maybe the, the practice rather than the theory, David. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Trevor. Um, yeah, my um, my sort of mini case study, um, the, uh, the first thing was um, you can have the perfect plan, but it may not happen. Uh, I left Deutsche Bank as a good lever in 2001, uh, and I had three, I had, a, I had over the previous six months created my initial portfolio of three uh, of three items, um, all of which were linked to the work I was doing in corporate venture capital, um, and I had I reckon I had between three and a half and four days work um, a week guaranteed for three years. I thought this is brilliant, um, and my first day in business was the Monday of the week of nine eleven. Um, two of my bits of business were companies uh, based in uh, Manhattan, and the projects that I'd been teed up to work on uh, sort of. Um, disappeared with uh, you know 9-11 so that's two bits gone and the third bit was a three-year contract with the division of Deutsche Bank I'd left and before the end of September there'd been a military coup the entire department was moved internally and all the staff were fired so I went wow. from having a, a kind of a ready-built you know Lego model portfolio career and the whole thing had just crumbled within two weeks um, so I then went the and the key lesson after that was um you don't have to have the entire portfolio mapped out on day one. So in my case, um, there are four components. First one, I managed to establish in 2002, which was uh, mentoring people looking to start businesses or grow them. It was four years before I got the second piece, which was doing work at uh, the business school that used to be called CAS, where I was working with both the executive education community and the student community on things to do with entrepreneurship and corporate entrepreneurship. Um, the third piece didn't come till 2010, uh, which is when I published the first of my eight books. And then the final piece came in 2015 when uh, I was invited to become a freeman of the Guild of Entrepreneurs, which gave me a chance to do some pro bono work and give something back to the community. So if you ignore the pro bono piece, um, in tweet length, it's kind of mentor, lecturer and author. Um, but it took me... Uh, I'm just trying to do the maths in my head now. It took me like 12 to 13 years to create the portfolio um, that um, you know, I'm still to a degree working with now. So it's not necessarily an overnight thing. It's an yeah. evolution, not a revolution. 
Yeah. And that kind of ties in with our next question, which was how do you get started? And I think I've certainly noticed an increase in my clients, I think, over the past year talking about they don't necessarily want to work in a conventional five day a week role anymore. Yeah. And, and lots of people are talking about portfolio careers. Um, so, uh, Trevor, have you got any views on how to get started? Well, there's there's a sort of past, present and future, if you like. You know, I mean, the past, the obvious one is sort of is to look at your own work history. If you've had a variety of jobs in the past, you sort of try and find the things that sort of link them all, all together, if you like, you know, in terms of the present, in terms of what are your skills, your individual skills that you can sort of draw out and and, and have something that people are prepared to, um, to, to acquire, if you like. Um, if you are getting started, but you're not necessarily sure whether you want this to be your future path you could you know we had a session on this a, a few weeks back didn't we with uh, with david mm -hmm. on trying a side hustle you know we, we don't yes. won't dwell on that too much this time but um but having a, a sort of a few sidelines on things sometimes give you a best kind of glimpse of what your life might look like if you decide to switch to a, a portfolio mm -hmm. career i mean david's quite right that 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 even the best laid plans can go wrong you know his, his uh, excellent example but i would still say that whilst you know as eisenhower once said that whilst plans are a useless planning is still essential because you 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 should have a, a good plan a sort of a, a thought about how you might do this i mean for people like me I, a lot of the worry of of a portfolio career is taken out by at least sort of having a always having a plan in my back pocket you know um, no matter how rudimentary of, of what i'm trying to do because that takes for me personally some of the anxiety out of that and of course it's just to just to make the most to, to really think about your current network of of connections and how you want to grow that moving to the future you know because if you are looking to develop a portfolio career in a particular area you want to be sort of steering your your linkedin connections or any other sort of set of networks towards towards that i think the other thing about portfolio career is that you'll be doing lots of different things and you need to sort of stay i think positive in uh well you need to try and stay positive or, or be resilient in what in what you're what you're what you're doing and and or develop a sort of strength i think we've all had to develop a certain sense of resilience in uh, in the last year um so it's a it can be a little bit like that in terms of in terms of building portfolio you get used to the unexpected happening but the unexpected is is part of the uh, the benefits as well Absolutely. So I've had a few comments in. So uh, first of all, hello to Helen from London. So thank you for commenting. Hello, Helen. Um, and Jeffrey has come up with a, a comment. So that's interesting. Guaranteed work for several years, three to four days per week. Is that taking existing relationships networks? I think that was in relation to your point, David. Uh, yeah, I mean, the answer is yes, it was. It was all linked to the work I was doing in my last three years at Deutsche Bank. So from 1998 to 2001. Um, but there's a great oxymoron. It was guaranteed work that uh, that lasted under a month. Um, but it came from uh, relationships within Deutsche Bank and some of the external part, you know, partners we were working with, particularly the investee companies where I was sitting on their boards. Yeah. Uh, and so it was like the perfect storm with um, the Deutsche unit being completely collapsed and the two companies in question uh, losing the projects that they wanted me to work on, uh, mm. which were triggered by 9-11. I mean, a lot of things got blamed on Brexit in the same way as a lot of things got blamed on 9-11. And it was a great reason for people, A, to stop spending money and B, to stop making decisions. So uh, uh, it was, I was, I remember I was in the Hilton Hotel in Midtown Manhattan and I was the only person there uh, because New York basically closed. Mm. So I was there when my, my initial portfolio collapsed. And I can tell you that's probably the darkest period of my life, you know, uh, you know, selfishly just thinking about me rather than what on earth was going on around me. But it was really, really tough. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and Jill's just added a comment here to say having a plan shows that you have thought seriously about your portfolio career. So, yes, I, I agree. Totally agree. It's definitely yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll have a good plan. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, any practical tips for managing different streams of work? So, Trevor, you did touch on this. Yeah. Um, a lot of it is to do with the. Um, yeah, the great the great enemy time, I think, you know, sort of um, it can be a great enemy, but it can also be a, a great a great friend. I mean, I, 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 I was thinking the other day about I used to work in, in the PR business and um, and I had to do billable time and I had to fill out all these these sort of uh, timesheets. I absolutely hated doing it at the, t at the time. But now that I'm running my own business, I realized it's probably the single most useful thing that I could have done. Not only do I have to 
obviously bill clients for the time, but I can actually also see where the, t the, the non-client time is going as well and how I'm using that time. So and then that helps you develop a, a set of, of prioritization in, in managing multiple projects. You should definitely sort of write out a sort of a plan for each project because then you can start to see how they kind of mesh with each other. And also there may be synergies between them. So, so there's, there's ways that you can actually sort of leverage your experience in one area to, uh, to another. Um, uh, the other thing I'd, I'd say is you should probably, even if your plan is always to just maintain a sort of portfolio career just for yourself as a sort of solo printer, it's really, I think it's important to keep, keep info in, in a single place. And you just have to imagine that if somebody you know, if something happened to me and and uh, and and then somebody else had to sort of take over, you 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 could easily instruct them as to where to find, or it would be intuitive in some ways because I think that's a good habit to get into because it just helps you become better organised and think logically. You know, um, uh, about what you're doing. The, one final thing, which is a particular one of of for me, is that is that pick something. If you're managing multiple projects, pick the thing you least want to do. Uh, and do it first thing in the morning and so, so I I always when it's something it's usually something a bit chunky something that I've been meaning to get around to and I just kind of that's the first thing I do and then I know the day is just going to get better after that so and that's quite important and often sometimes the thing that often the thing that you're least wanting to do is probably become the thing that you have to do most urgently because you put it off <laughs> yeah the, absolutely. The past. yeah that's good David anything to add to that yeah, a, a few quick kind of sound bites on um, kind of you know how you manage these different streams. Firstly, uh, I think you have to learn to be very selfish with your time. Mm. Uh, otherwise, you're gonna you're gonna get in a mess. Uh, and secondly, try to leave yourself some wriggle room uh, so that you can avoid overcommitting. That you've got you've got a bit of uh, time that you can allocate. Thirdly, um, you have to be really careful that you apply the same amount of uh, effort and commitment and engagement to each part of the portfolio because all the clients in each part that aren't really bothered about the other things you do you are they're not so you have to make them all feel special so you have to work super hard to make sure you know you're you're uh, creating client delight um it, as with entrepreneurial businesses one of the famous sayings is that if you're starting a business fail fast learn and move on and don't get overstressed if there's something in your portfolio that's not working just make a tough decision step back from it you know yeah. and then kind of um, and carry on um can you come up with something where you can make money in your sleep uh in my case it was the books and the other was taking some of my classroom material online uh, in terms of e-learning modules um yeah. and so uh, that was quite good um the final two, I think one of them is being careful with having a coherent personal brand, because depending on what the constituent parts of the portfolio are, they don't necessarily sit easily in terms of somebody looking at your profile. I'm, I'm getting close to Sarah's LinkedIn uh, territory here, but you, know, you have to be careful that you don't confuse the marketplace in terms of what you're about and where your expertise lies. Um, because the second there is a degree of confusion out there, it increases the likelihood that opportunities don't go anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. There's a famous saying from one of my colleagues, a guy called Mark Fritz, who says, if, if there's mist in the pulpit, there's fog in the pews. And that's exactly going to be the case if you, haven't, if you haven't come up with a way of articulating what it is you're about and what you stand for so that the different parts of the portfolio aren't competing with each other in terms of the other party's perception of who you are. And then finally, in terms of looking at your network, uh, and Trevor's already mentioned this, um, yeah, have you got the network you need uh, as opposed to the network you've got? So have you got to make some changes there? Um, who are the people in that network you should prioritize and focus on? And in particular, who can you talk to who's been on the journey you're going on that you yeah. can find out from them what works, what doesn't work, and so on? And people are normally really happy to talk about this stuff, yeah. uh, particularly if your portfolio isn't going to be competing with theirs. Um, so well worth doing. Yeah, and I, I think talking about things like LinkedIn, as you say, David, if you do have multiple streams, then that's absolutely fine to to have that on LinkedIn, but explain it. So on my profile, for instance, I talk about career coaching is kind of my my main thing, but then aside to that, I do other things like my running coaching and our holiday lair and things like that. And it is actually surprising how much of an overlap there can be. So I have now had some of my career coaching clients wanting to book my holiday place in Cornwall, and I've also had a career coaching 
client who then did some running coaching with me so it kind of does work and I think it's really important to tell yeah. people what it is you do and mostly people are interested and they kind of want to learn a bit more I guess this thing about I mean I totally endorse what you, you both said this what I was thinking about as you were talking was this this world of overlap where there are so many unexpected benefits from you know doing one thing and then maybe you know showing your your human or non-work side sort of you know to, mm. and you just be surprised what connections people join the dots for you in terms of seeing opportunities you know for you and this thing that David said in particular earlier about flow you know the flow you know when, when you can make money in your in your sleep it's amazing how I think one of the things that I totally underestimated about portfolio career is that you not only have the value of the connections between the various things that you do but also you, un you probably tend to underestimate the value of that to, to others. And if you can find ways to replicate that and build that, then actually you can literally sort of make money in your sleep by develop turning the, some of that service or offering into, into what people might call products and, and, and actually sort of and basically sell them, whether that's a book or, a, um, or, a, or some sort of other offering. It's amazing uh, the extent to which you can leverage, you know, sort of what you're, what you're offering. And you just get lots of... Mm rounded insight from being working in a, in a portfolio career in that way yeah brilliant okay so Jill's just come back to say and this was relating to the plan that it's important to stay flexible etc yeah. so that's good yeah. um got a message from uh Deborah here who said can you start with yourself by experimenting to see if it will work before having clients so I uh, guess having like a pilot or something like that yeah, I mean, I, I, that's that's how I've started a lot of ideas. You know, to be honest, is that I've I've gone and tried it for myself. It's a bit of a, a, a you know, it's a it's it's a bit of a a golden rule that I I couldn't seek to sell something to someone unless I knew that it that it worked. And mm. and so I, I tend to be a quite a harsh a harsh judge, um, you know, so I, of myself on on that. But then, of course, you know, the people of everybody you know, should or will either have an honest friend who they can talk to about, you know, mm. what does this mean to you or a or an or a or a, a client that they're familiar and say, look, if I tried this out on on you, would you regard this as valuable? You know, even if you're or maybe offer it to them for free or a knockdown price as, as some way to sort of pilot the project so that they feel they're getting good value out of it. And also whilst they know that you're they're your um, guinea pig. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean I think you can if you if you say to them that you're you're kind of wearing a research hat, it, it makes it it de risks yeah. it from their point yeah. of view. It's less threatening, and they're more likely mm. to take one. Yeah, and I've actually Absolutely. seen it work both ways. Some people being able to prove to themselves that what they're planning to do works in practice, and in other cases, they are one hundred percent convinced they absolutely don't want to do it um, when they see what it's really like. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I have a question here from John. So uh, I know John's in Chicago. So thank you for joining because that must be pretty early there. So um, is there a way on LinkedIn to segregate networks for different streams? Can there be two profiles? So shall I take that one? So I have seen people have two profiles on LinkedIn, but I, I think that it, it leads to confusion, to be honest, because you're you're going to have different people potentially following different profiles or you might have the same people following both and not really knowing. I think if someone's trying to connect to you, they would then see both profiles and maybe not not know which one to connect to. So I think probably what I would do is if you have some fairly substantial um, chunks in your portfolio career so for instance if you look at mine so I've got my career coaching one then what I've done is set up a company page for my company um, and then I would use that to kind of advertise my business services um, so I still have my own personal page, but I have a business page for that as well. And you could do that if you had different things. So if my if I decided to kind of really up up the rampage on my running coaching, I could do the same thing there and have a page set up for that. So then my profile would be linked to those pages um, and I would just use the, the right one as appropriate. But I think personally, I think um, just having one profile page for an individual is the best way to go and just explain it in your in your about section. I, I I I've I've often wondered, John, the same thing myself. You know, in terms of in terms of should I have two profiles? And I, I reached the same conclusion as as Sarah. Really, I started to feel sort of slightly sort of schizophrenic about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And that actually, actually, I was both of these these people. You know, sort of offering yeah. or, or sometimes the all three of 
me. And uh, and I and I and I found that for me personally, the way to sort of rationalize it was to actually make it a virtue by actually you know actually in my pro in my own profile at the top it's it's just got little bullet points of of the things that i do and it does cover a multitude of um of sins but it gets across you know and, and if, if something one thing's taken over from the other and i want that to be like that then i just reprioritize uh, mm. um, them and but you just should always be looking at linkedin profile and tinkering around with it anyway yeah, I, I think that about section, people tend to say now kind of update it every couple of weeks almost, just yeah. keep going back, having a yeah. look. Yeah. So I can see we've got more questions coming in here. So I'm <laughs> conscious we need to move on to semi-retirement. But um, OK, so uh, John says pages, that's like Facebook. right? Yeah, so it is exactly like that. Um, Mark, I wonder whether having one profile helps connect your portfolio yeah. together. And I think it yeah. can yeah, do. It yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. that goes back to the kind of the theme, doesn't it, that we talked about before, um, at which mm -hmm. Mark has said there. That's great. Um, and thank you. No, thanks, John. That's a really good question. OK, so back on over then. So uh, we're going to move to semi-retirement now. So, David, if you could start with this one. So what do we mean when we talk about semi-retirement? OK, I think I can win us a bit of time and do this one quite quickly. <laughs> um, the, it's really, um, this is my own definition, it's anything which is an alternative to going from working flat out uh, in one employed role to doing nothing and hanging your boots up. So it could be you just reduce your level of activity on in the line of business you are associated with, or it could be that you reduce that core line of ability of activity even more so you can take on one or two other things that would then become your portfolio or you could completely step away from your traditional career and do something either one thing or several things radically different so it could be it's like it could be, it could be any of those versions but i think the key thing is and why it's becoming more and more interesting for people is that the, we're learning more and more about neuroscience, the way the brain works, influences our behavior. And one of the things that makes semi-retirement so attractive is that rather than going from being bonkers busy to doing nothing, uh, your brain still believes it has a purpose because you're doing new things, different things. It's curious and it wants to kind of build the neural pathways to help you do that. If you literally just go, and if I think back to my father and my father-in-law, they went from one career full-time to doing nothing and being very maudlin about it they almost just pulled up the drawbridge and prepared to die um and the part of that is because that if you're not doing something and keeping your brain active it thinks its job's done so it shuts down yeah. uh and i thought i don't fancy that as a plan in my case so um the semi-retirement thing was really was really important uh, to me and i think in a nutshell that's basically what it is it's it's just this intermediate step. So you're easing into retirement rather than it just being a 100% immersion overnight. And, and one thing, I mean, David, I mean, David's literally written the book on the, on the subject. So, so, you know, I've got it here in fact, you know, so, um, but it's, um, it, it's from my, from my point of view, who you know, I, I think that this kind of in between moment of sort of semi, uh, semi retirement, it's. I think it can be. It's. It's kind of your. You're maybe you're working less, but you're far more energized in what you're. You're actually doing because it gives you a chance to actually think about what do I really want to do. All these things that maybe I said I wanted to do. Actually, I don't really want to do them after all. And 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 actually, it allows you to sort of, sort of brush away all the dust and discover what the the the, the passion projects are. And you and and you will find that so much easier to sort of get up and about and do that thing. And even if you're only working half the time, you're probably feeling. You know, twice the amount of uh, enjoyment as a, as a result. So it gives you a chance to uncover your passions. Yeah, excellent. Mm. So in terms of planning, when do you recommend people start planning for semi-retirement? Um, uh, okay, my, my non-serious answer uh, <laughs> is, is a period of five years. That's because uh, I had a complete disaster. You can have a plan that would win the Nobel Prize for Literature, but if you don't execute it, it's pretty worthless. Uh, and I... Um, in brief, I made a deal uh, with myself and my wife that when I reached 60, I'd go down to a four-day week. When I reached 65, I'd go down to a three-day week. And then at 70, I would hang up my boots and go and play golf or you know do whatever. Um, and it was a complete and utter disaster. I failed miserably. I would have scored very close to zero out of 100 on the various metrics, um, which is why I wrote the book, um, which Trevor's already mentioned. And it's 30 lessons I learned in getting it wrong um so that's the non-serious answer um 
But I think in theory, and I think in today's world, and it goes back to Jill's question about needing to sort of change and be flexible and so on. Um, one of the key things is that you have to be agile. And I think COVID has, has, has actually really profiled that. The people who are going to be successful are the people who are fleet of foot, agile, adaptable, and so on. So I think, um, you know, if you, if you go about it the right way and you have a period of reflection, before you even get to planning, that you have a period of reflection just to think through, am I doing the right thing? Is this for me? And again, talk to other people who've done it. I reckon you should be able to come up with a, a plan to move to semi-retirement in, I would say, a year. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity, as Trevor said, to re-energize and kind of reinvent yourself. Um, but you need to go into it eyes wide open. So I think that period of reflection and planning before you start doing anything is really, really important. And I would say, I would say about a year. Yeah. And I guess we t we talked yesterday about sort of financial implications, didn't we? So I guess you might have a, a longer plan in mm. terms of thinking, when am I going to be able to afford this? Yeah, but then, like yeah. you say, the kind of the detail yeah. can be much, yeah. much sooner than that. So there's a comment here from Mark. So I think, Trevor, your face might get covered up because it's quite long. And there you go. Yes. <laughs> OK. So uh, Mark said, a client of mine, when I asked him about how he now may be looking at semi-retirement, was really interesting. Mm. It's now less about my retirement and more about how I want to live my yeah, life. So I think exactly. that fits in really well with what yeah. you've both been saying, doesn't yeah, it? 100%. Yeah. OK. OK. So next question then. So uh, what issues do people generally have when they're trying to semi-retire? So I think you've touched on your uh, experience there, David. Yeah. I'll, I'm conscious of the time. So I will, I will just it's reinforce fine. That's that, fine. Is that you, you, can't, you can't make the decision to go down to, say, a three-day week and then try and cram five days work into three. It doesn't work. Um, mm. yeah, I am the living proof of that, you know, because I did it over five years. Um, and I said, hence the book. So I think the trying to cram too much in is probably the biggest issue. And then the second biggest issue is what I'd call the guilt factor. And this is where people feel bad about having a free day or a free half day. So they're looking for things to do so they're not taking advantage of the time. So if they, they'll sneak off to the golf course and feel really you know, guilty about it. Or uh, mm -hmm. So I, I think blocking time, which is genuine time for yourself and your family, um, so that you don't lapse into, you know, sort of poking your nose into work on a day that is, in theory, a non-work day. And um, so I think what I found particularly useful was creating a set of 10 very simple measures that, you know, we're not going to be a bureaucratic thing. And each month I measure them. Five of them are to do with personal kind of activity and five are to do with business and I score each one out of 10, and then it forces me to readdress things if, uh, um, you know, if there's something where I've not been giving it the attention it deserves. So um, I, I think that it's it's really not change, finding it uncomfortable changing your how you use your time. I, uh, I, would, I, I would take, have I got a moment? Yeah, no, you carry on. There's a couple yeah. of comments, but you carry on and then I'll okay, put those right. up. Okay, right. So very quickly, totally agree with what David said. For me, for, um, I think the issue, a lot of the issues are around the way you make decisions. You know, so mm -hmm. to say yes to something, you kind of say, you have to ask yourself, does does this project or whatever it is sort of fit in with my 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 life plan, mm -hmm. if you like? Because by then, your mm -hmm. rest of your life plan is very important. You know, am I excited to do it? Can I afford to do it? Can I afford not to do it? Mm -hmm. Does it, does yeah. it fit with my sense of integrity? And also, will I regret not doing this? You know, so you, know, you need to ask yourself those sorts of yeah. questions to make you either say yes or say no. And then I think the answer becomes sort of, in most cases, becomes sort of a, a little bit clearer. Yeah. I mean, I found, you know, I found it was, you had to make some tough decisions about what to keep and what to let go. Mm. And the stuff that you were letting go or new stuff where you were saying no, it was being able to do that and feel okay about it. Yeah. Which yeah. is one of the hardest things I had to learn because my natural instinct was to help everybody, and I had to start saying no. Mm. Um, but I tried to say no in a way I could find them an alternative, you know, um, you know, and redirect stuff. Um, and one of the other lessons I learned was, uh, which I'd learned through sales, but I particularly learned it in this kind of trying to trim back the uh, the work, was not every client is a good client, mm. um, and sort of uh, easing out of relationships which didn't fit in my brave new world anymore. Yeah. 
-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, I just want to go through these comments. So uh, Jill here is saying, I think that we need to think about tra transitioning into a different way of working quite early on, mm -hmm. and then more detailed plans can come close to the time. So mm -hmm. yes, I agree with that. And uh, Deborah is asking for the title of your book. So we will add that in the comments. But obviously, David, if you want to, oh, there you, there you go. go. There you Changing chat, David Mella. <laughs> excellent thank you trevor um jill never, has never without a prop <laughs> excellent. Yeah. Um, so jill's also said how do you stick to a set number of days a week and still offer a service so i think you kind of just touched on that david didn't you about you know looking at your clients and yeah i mean most them. of the work i do lends itself to it um uh, but i tend to measure it over a month so my target is to do less than 12 days a month uh, because if I say I'm doing something at CAS where I'm a program director, uh, that could be a Monday to Friday. But mm -hmm. that then means I have to compensate for that in the following week, you know, and, and take more days off. And so, I mean, my run rate for the last two years has been 10.5, uh, you know, whereas my run rate in the five years before that was closer to 20 than uh, 12. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so my, the, the type of work I'm doing by and large lends itself to kind of compartmentalizing my working month yeah that's but a good point isn't it so, yeah. Yeah. yeah good okay um so we've got a question from harry so reconciling to a different income might be a big factor for some and yes yeah. absolutely yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so i guess that comes back to the kind of the early planning doesn't it so when yeah. are you actually going to be able to afford to do this and yeah. how much income are you going to need from your semi-retirement yeah. plans i guess yeah. Yeah. It also links back, it's where the portfolio career and semi-retirement overlap in that mm -hmm. when you start, when you're doing the planning, it's important you kind of figure out like a survival budget in terms of how how much, how, how to what extent do I need to make some money out of what I'm known for and I know I can do to give me that predictable baseline cash flow, then mm -hmm. I build the other parts of the portfolio on top of that. Yeah. And that will be different for everybody. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, um, and Mark here saying, I find free time and guilt very true. Still working on it, haven't solved it yet. I try and always keep Fridays free for an early dart. <laughs> so, yeah, I try to as well, but it never really seems to work. <laughs> um, yep, Jill here, career planning, yeah. financial planning go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, and uh, Jeffrey, so yes to Harry's point, I agree. If you don't have enough income, it's a basic yeah. though essential. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we are uh, slightly over now. So it's the, the last question, which we have touched on this already. So can a portfolio career and semi-retirement work together? Um, yeah, I think yeah. can. Yeah. <laughs> well, the quick answer then, yes. then it, yeah. is yes. I think that there are synergies between the two and it's not, it's like a spectrum, you know, you sort of slowly go from one to the other you know mm. and so they actually work they work well together so yeah. Yeah. Is yes from my point yeah. of view yeah I mean, the, the most fulfilled people i have come across are people who are continuing to make some money out of what they have been known for down the years yeah. who had a chance to do something that they didn't want to be in their deathbed regretting that they never got a chance to do and have a chance to give something back to the community uh, either at large or locally where they live uh, and they tend to be the people who are the most fired up, the most energized and the most fulfilled, even yeah. if the total of that is less than their earnings when they're in full time employment. Yeah, yeah. I think having the, the confidence to just do what you want to do as well is a big part of it, isn't it? I mentioned yesterday yeah. I, I, I was chatting to one of our other 1080 coaches about coming on LinkedIn Live and he just flat out said no, because I know what I enjoy and I know that I won't enjoy that. Mm. So I'm not doing it. And I thought, actually, that's, you know, fair mm. enough. Don't do not do things you yeah. don't want to do. I think, I think, you know, you know, you've cracked it when philosophically you genuinely believe in your heart that you're actually being paid to have fun. Mm. 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 That's totally, totally yeah, true. Yeah, ideal. Yeah. Okay, so final thought, any final thought or top tip to take away? So maybe if uh, David, yours is on semi-retirement and Trevor, yours on portfolio. I know we didn't talk about this yesterday, but <laughs> I'll put you on the spot. Okay. Um, I think mindset-wise, you uh, I don't know why I'm saying this, but mindset-wise, you just may want to think about it as, you know, that's why I, I titled the book Changing Tack, because semi-retirement almost sounds like you're kind of stepping back, you know, um, whereas changing tap just means you are transitioning to a different work-life balance. So it's a more positive kind of statement. 
Uh, yeah, and it's my very, yeah. brother, she beat me up and made me change the title and he was right you know which is not the first time um uh so yeah i would i would say that it's you know my top tip is to view it as a step forwards as opposed to a step sideways or backwards yeah so, that's great my, my 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 well my top tip is you know don't underestimate and i think most people do underestimate including myself in the early days the the um the uh, contagion, if you like, of in a good way between the various mm -hmm. things that you that you do and the benefits that one can have to the other and the way that that then appears to the outside world. And don't underestimate the skills you have to offer in the first place, because I think people underestimate that. So they, they pigeonhole themselves. So don't allow yourself to be pigeonholed. And, and, and the final thing is just just enjoy yourself, because once you start mm -hmm. to once you start to be doing you know, work that you're actually choosing, you know, there's, 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 it's actually is incredibly enjoyable and fulfilling. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, thank you both so much for coming on. It's been a really great conversation. Um, so uh, we've just yeah. had one more comment here from Sybil to say yes, two sides of the same coin. So that was relating again to the career planning, etc. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you everyone again for joining. It's been really, really great. Um, next week, I am back again with Jill Amos and Joe Green, who have both been on before. So we're talking about CVs again. And next week, it's the difference between chronological CVs CVs, which kind of the standard CVs and functional CVs and when you might want to use either. So please do join us and look forward to seeing you then. Thanks very much. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>